Well, howdy there, Internet people. It's Bo again. So the other day on Twitter, I saw this comment. And it basically said, you know, the sad part is that we only ever really learn about these cultures when something bad happens to them. The person was talking about at-risk cultures. Man, he's right. He's right, and that's part of the problem. We only learn about it when something bad happens to them. Which means, in order to get people to care, we have to tell them who they are first. And that takes time. And meanwhile, that bad thing is still happening. He's right. It's a big problem. So let's fix it. So tonight we're going to talk about uh, some parallels that exist between China and the United States that some people may not know about. And we're going to see how technology can become a trap, a literal trap. And um, to highlight this, we are going to talk about the Uyghurs. Now, if you don't know who they are, I promise you've seen headlines. It's uh, like U-I-G-H-U-R. Um, now, they live in an area of China called Xinjiang. Literally translated, that means a new frontier. It's called that because in the 1800s, the Han started settling it under the Qing Dynasty. And the parallels between what was happening then and what was happening in the United States at the same time, they're, they're pretty striking. It was pretty much the same thing. Go west, young man. And when you get out there, well, you run into this bizarre, strange culture, people that aren't like you. So, of course, what do you do? Well, you have to civilize them, right? And that's what happened. Now, the Uyghurs, for their part, they've been there pretty much forever. Um, they're descendants from the traders that Marco Polo saw on his journey. And because they're on this transcontinental trade route, you get to see something unique in that part of the world when you're walking through those towns. Blonde hair. Blue eyes, green eyes, stuff like that. It's kind of odd. Now, in 1933, they set up their own country. It was called the Republic of East Turkestan. It did not last long. When the communists took over in 1949, well, that pretty much, that was it. <laughs> it, it became part of China. Now, as far as religion... They practice a uh, version of Islam. It's not really a version of Islam. It's Sufism. It adds a mystical component. I've heard people describe it as Islam with extra credit. Now, because a lot of these traditions and these rituals are newer, the fundamentalists don't really like it that much, and we'll just leave it at that. Now, this region that they're in, it's oil-rich course it is. <laughs> Otherwise, it wouldn't matter, right? They are technically in what is called an autonomous zone, but it is being rapidly settled by the Han, which is the ethnic minor uh, majority, white people in the U.S. Um, this whole time, the relationship between the Uyghurs and Beijing has been uncomfortable, to put it mildly. And then, uh, well, a couple dozen Uyghurs were discovered at a training camp in Afghanistan. And that certainly caught Beijing's attention. Now, to be fair, prior to this, there had been some riots and some bombings in the 90s, in the 1990s and early 2000s. Uh, that led to a security clampdown, a pretty massive one. Now, Beijing, of course, cast this as them being the benevolent civilizer. They did what all benevolent civilizers do. They subjugated them, they relocated them, um, and they brought in their own people. In this case, by the millions. And this happened in the 1990s and 2000s. And the Han that were moved in, almost all of them worked in oil and natural gas extraction. So there was a monetary motive as well. Then this thing that didn't really seem like a big deal at the time happened. The Uyghurs got 3G. 3G cell service. 
They got smartphones. And mass surveillance came with it. Beijing was worried about extremification. And that was in 2011. By 2016, they were gathering DNA, scanning faces, getting voice prints, conducting stop and frisk, and you had to open up your cell phone. They mapped people's relationships, their social networks, everything. It became a massive data collection operation. They interviewed millions of people to determine who was good, which ones were the good ones, who was trustworthy. To do this, they brought in 90,000 cops, almost all of which were Han, who view the weaker as primitive. They also brought in about a million other government employees. Now, that was 2016. Where were we at today? Camps. About a million adults in camps. China is currently calling them vocational centers. Um, prior to them being outed by journalists, they just denied it. When it was just rumors, they're like, no, these things don't exist. But now they admit they do, but it, their casting is kind of voluntary, which is not true. Um, journalists have been allowed to go to some of the camps, but it is very staged. It is ridiculously staged. It's more staged th than that show Border Patrol put on. It's obviously faked. Um, <clears throat> so we're talking about 10% of the adult population, a million people. What about the kids? Well, of course, they're in government-run schools with Han administrators. They are taught Chinese culture rather than Uyghur. They don't learn Arabic script, which is how their people typically right. They're erasing the culture, they're erasing the ethnicity. There's a word for that. Um, so it definitely parallels the native experience in the United States. The other thing I think people should notice is how quickly that progression happened. 2011 they got 3G. Mass surveillance started. Eight years later there's camps really quick. Really quick. So that's a little brief primer on who they are. And uh, I got a feeling they may become the next cause of the day where everybody gasps at something that happened. So when and if it does, at least you'll know who they are. Eight years. Anyway, it's just a thought. Y'all have a good night.